Hi and welcome, to Generous Theology. In this episode, Chuck and Brock examine material from Robert Passnow's Chapter 26, Science and Certainty, from the Cambridge History of Medieval Philosophy. All right. Should we jump in, science and certainty? <laughs> this is Professor Robert Passnow's chapter, Science and Certainty. And Chuck, usually I give a little brief introduction here, but I've always been wondering, the past few chapters, I've spent this time talking about Aristotle as the first part of getting into the medieval philosophy, because the medieval philosophy is such a reaction, it's such a response, and it builds upon what Aristotle had written. And so I find, of course, it's the same thing here in this chapter. And basically, there's a focus on the posterior analytics of Aristotle into these topics of what is science? What does it mean for something to be scientific? And then we're going to talk about this idea of certainty and see what the medievals thought about it. And so I find myself, again, going back to the one more time and hoping the bottom doesn't fall out on the bucket. What was it like for you just getting into the first part of this and seeing things develop out of the same fountain that we'd explored previously? Yeah. So one of the things I really enjoyed about this chapter is even just a 40,000 foot view of issues of certainty and science and faith and how there's so much here. And Hasnow is certainly writing from a philosophical or a historical philosophical perspective, but there is a lot in this chapter that is, I think, applicable far beyond the application that Pasnow gives it. And one of those things, and it's something that I have thought a lot about over the years, is even how some of these concepts can tie into the Christian concept of faith. And certainly faith is not the same thing as scientific certainty, but there are some parallels, and especially there become parallels when certain people turn science into its own faith system, which I would argue has happened uh, to some extent. Uh, uh, to a great extent. And I would argue, and, and we've talked a little bit about this past months and years even, that some of the reaction we're seeing in postmodern thought may even be a reaction to an overreaction on the side of the empiricists, of those who have built their faith system on merely the scientific method. And one of the reasons this 40,000 foot view is really interesting is because I found a couple of things. One is, there are a lot of Christians who struggle a little bit with certainty and faith and knowledge. And I, I think it's not all that uncommon for Christians to on occasion struggle and say, I'm not sure. I, I believe this stuff. I have faith in it. But there are times when we go through these crises of faith. And for some Christians, that crisis of faith can be really difficult to deal with. Others, I think, work through it in different ways. It then ties into a lot of these other concepts as well, because you'll run into people who poo-poo the idea of religious faith and of religious certainty, and yet there can be those same faith crises in people when things turn out not to be what they expect. And while Pasnow isn't really dealing specifically with those crises of faith, those crises of certainty, because I've run into enough people who have experienced those things, Christians and non-Christians alike, it's just of, of real interest to me. So that, that's all to say that perhaps that way of thinking and that framework colors the way that I read this chapter. And a lot of my interest in it, while certainly I'm interested in a lot of the history and got people understanding Aristotle in different ways and understanding different writings of his. And early on, we, we see that Pasnell makes the, the claim that some of the very earliest medieval folks had only read Aristotle's old material and that they came to realize that he had newer material that they hadn't really engaged. Those things are really interesting and I think can be very helpful, but it is really that uh, 40,000 foot framework of just even thinking about how are we ever certain, whether it is theological certainty, whether it is scientific certainty, those are really
really important things in our everyday lives. And they have a major psychological impact, I think, on people and how they engage with the world. And so to think about how the medievals dealt with that is really important and is really helpful because, as we've also pointed out in the past, we stand on the shoulders of the giants who came before us. And even in those areas where medieval thought is no longer considered state of the art or even uh, helpful, still we built on that and it, it's worth thinking about. And we may get into some other comments uh, regarding that uh, as we move through the chapter. There are a few places where I highlighted some notes there on, on that, that relate to just that way of thinking. But I just wanted to preface it with that 40,000 foot view, that framework through which I was uh, reading the chapter. Yeah, thank you for that, Chuck. I love that framework. I love that setting it apart and setting it out in that way. We're going to, we started with Aristotle. We're going to get to the medievals. Really, we are. <laughs> but we're not going to get them, get there to them without first also passing through the modern movement and postmodernism. Basically, everything since sort of the secular enlightenment. And that's because we have to contrast what the medievals are doing here by contrast to what the moderns have done. So think of post-Kant in the Secular Academy, Kant-Hegel and the phenomenology that follows from it is the big contrast to uh, what came before it, what these medieval thinkers were doing. And, and it comes down to this. In an earlier episode, Chuck, I told you that I was a medieval thinker, that I was a person of the medieval age. And that's easy to that's easy to cartoon, and that's easy to demagogue and paint in a pejorative, as if by saying that something like "I really want to go back to a time before toilet paper," "I want to go back to a time before modern conveniences," "I'm against all that," "I just want us all to live under feudalism." It, it, that's an easy cartoon to to draw up, but that's not what I mean by it. What I mean by saying the statement. I'm a medieval thinker, is that it's in reference to this idea of this pursuit of systematic scientific knowledge. The Latin tradition has now refers to as scientia. Now it starts, or, or let's just say it, it, it is bootstrapped in a very interesting way with the high medieval ages and the thinkers of that time having the posterior analytics available to them in a new and fresh way. But it has this underlying essentialism to it. And I think we've talked before about the distinction between an existential outlook on reality and an essentialistic outlook on reality. And so that's really the key difference here. I think to be a medieval thinker is to be classically essentialistic. That is to say, you conceive of reality as something bigger than yourself, something that contains yourself, and you and I are objects that move about in a larger sphere, in a larger container that we call reality. And that's very essentialistic. And this contrasts with the idea of the secular enlightenment, this phenomenological idea that is existentialistic. And that's the idea that it's not so much, Chuck, that you and I are objects floating in the container of objective reality. It's really much more that we are objective reality and what is outside of us is floating around in the space of us. We are the center. This is almost like Protagoras, the pre-Socratic. Man is the measure of all things. And so the tables have turned very starkly from the medieval way of thinking into the modern. And so we have to refresh this idea of what the medievals were even talking about, because it's so scorned and so neglected today. People routinely just generate and make up things about reality that phenomenologically define reality by what's inside of themselves. And I think we can say pretty confidently that the medievals largely did not do that. It's not that they were unaware of the inner landscape of the human mind and the human understanding. It's not that they were unaware that human apprehension about objects in reality is conditioned by perception and by the human mind. It's just that there is this essentialism underneath all of it. And underneath most of that essentialism was an inescapable theism. And in the West, a Christianism or Christianity or what's been called Christendom. I have a working thesis that, and, and I've mentioned this with you before, that the secular enlightenment is 
almost precisely the negative reaction to the essentialism of the medieval age of faith and the essentialistic implications behind it. So that was just, that was a really long way to introduce and set some groundwork. We're still going to have to talk about what is science that we should study it in the first place, because it turns out that is not nearly as obvious as you might think. I know what science is, somebody might say. Oh, do you? When you read this chapter, you're going to find out that there are a lot of subtleties around science that uh, it's not clear that when I'm talking about science, it's necessarily the same thing that someone else is referring to when they're talking about science. And so Paz now brings that out, and this chapter is really good for getting into the meat of that. This intellectual grasp of a true proposition grounded in an understanding of why that proposition is true, this essentialism. That's how I love to break that down, Chuck. How does that bounce off for you, and, and where do you see that? Is that a good way to come from, or are there other angles that you thought about as well? Yeah, I, we've been talking about that essentialism versus existentialism idea and that growing thesis in our discussions over the past number of weeks. I think it is a useful way uh, to think through this. One of the interesting things that I found as I engaged with that idea, doing some of this reading, we've talked a little bit about how there can still be value for essentialists in understanding the existentialist perspective, and there may be some areas where existentialism pulls the pendulum back, where perhaps certain essentialists went too far. I also find, and, and, and so thinking through that process of, hey, the medievals were very much essentialist. There's a reason they were essentialist. Some of that is, is their the theistic worldview. Some of it, I think, is also just a very practical uh, common sense. I, I think most people who don't have a deep grounding in philosophical concepts tend to be in some extent essentialist because it's the way that our bodies tend to perceive the world in, in, in some sense. But it's also interesting to think through that the medievals, because they, they certainly did have that essentialist perspective, and yet there was not always a full agreement on exactly how that all worked out either. And, and that's interesting too. And there is, a there I think, a couple of things that come out of it for me. One, Pazna, and, and I think some of the other writers in this book, as well, have on occasion talked about how much of the medieval thought experiment disappears at some point. And I don't think it was Pazna in this chapter. I may have read it somewhere else. Someone very explicitly makes point that, hey, at some point we may come back to some of these. It's true that we've wandered away from some of these medieval ideas. And maybe there's a sense when you're a medievalist, you want to believe that what you're studying is still very much relevant. You and I obviously think that it is, but there may be others that, that don't. So some of it is that wishful thinking that someday we're going to come back to some of these medieval concepts and find them to be still useful, perhaps not in the same way that the medievals found them still useful. And so thinking about how essentialist or medievalist ways of thinking about the world might have a positive impact on philosophy. That's one thing that, that, that I've been thinking about. The other is tying it in, as you did earlier, to, to the theism of so many medieval thinkers. The European medieval world was was very much a theistic world, mostly Christians, certainly impacted by Islam and by Judaism, but certainly almost entirely monotheistic thinkers, and monotheistic thinkers who took very seriously the presence of a god, and a god who is engaged in some way in the world around it. And again, I, I was thinking a little bit about this break between existentialism and essentialism, and thinking about, are there other options? Option. Is there something else? Or is there something where we might think a little bit outside the box and find ourselves primarily in one camp or the other, the essentialist camp perhaps, or maybe not, but where we move away from the rejection that has come, especially since the 18th century, of a theistic worldview? And, and how might we bring back among Christian philosophers a sense that this theistic worldview is really important? And how might that impact the way that we think about philosophy? And is it going to mean an entirely new 
new project that is almost separate from the philosophizing that is happening in the world today in the economy, or is it something that could have an impact? And I, 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 there's a couple of places I could go with that. And actually, one of the one of the things I, I think we'll save for a later date because I think it fits in a little bit more towards the end of this chapter, or even into the next chapter on divine illumination. But in thinking about these concepts and the, the tie into essentialism and existentialism, that has been a very helpful way for me to think about. And I think as others as well, maybe people listening into our conversations or even just us as we're thinking through these things, it, it is useful to think in, in those terms and then also try to think outside of those terms and find whether we end back up in those ways of thinking or is there something else out? And I don't have any answers to that. It's just that's the path that I've been going through as I've been uh, through those. So what does it mean then if we're essentialist or existentialist and yet we're absolutely convinced that there is more to creation than merely what we see, merely human self and the physical world that, that we perceive, but that there is a, a further dimension to that, and that's the dimension of, of God and God's existence and his creative work, and how does that engage then with the theories of the mind and theories of perception? And 